the Commando Memorial, set in the heart of the Scottish Highlands, pays tribute to the courage of those brave volunteers who performed whatsoever their king commanded during the course of World War II. It was in these hills that the commandos trained for a new kind of warfare, covert guerrilla action that demanded a special kind of soldier. By June 1940, Nazi troops dominated mainland Europe and Britain was under heavy fire from the Luftwaffe. London was burning and the German invasion of England's south coast appeared inevitable. Humiliating defeats in Norway, France and the Western Desert, culminating in the evacuation of Dunkirk, led Sir Winston Churchill to form a specialist fighting force he instructed Sir Roger Keyes, Admiral of the Fleet, to find those men and officers who would be ready to spring at the throat of the enemy. Shimmy Fraser, Lord Lovett, a young officer in the Scots Guards, was quick to volunteer. We were the original commando volunteers. Uh, we weren't even called commandos until just about that time. Immediately after the fall of Dunkirk, there was a call for volunteers. You didn't have to be a cavalryman or a guardsman or a gunner. You could come from a mobile bath unit. Anything at all that had uniform, wore his uniform. But was a volunteer for what became eventually a shock troop set up. But not then. We were still learning. And neither officers or men were particularly efficient. Some were and some weren't. But we were all beginners. The Frasers owned land in the Highlands, wild, inhospitable country, which was to prove ideal training ground for these raw recruits. Well, we took over something like five or six deer forests, 300,000 acres of land, where we could do anything we liked. One could force march by night, you could put dummy charges on things and blow them up, you could fire live ammunition at each other, you could learn to swim ashore, learn to get into boats in the dark and do really severe marches lying out in the heather in winter. They were immensely confident because they were put through the hoop under conditions which were very trying and ruthlessly applied. And we had no tradition, so we made our tradition. Now the, the training in this area is absolutely fabulous, really. It was, and being young, some of us enjoyed it, and we did. If I say enjoyed the training, they did enjoy the training. And it was only later on, when perhaps we got used to that, we began to feel a bit, oh, to hell, not another 60-mile route march. We've done enough of these. But at the time, up in these areas, in this part of the country, it was fabulous. Trained and ready for war, the commandos were growing impatient for action but it was to be some time before they looked the enemy in the eye. I think Roger Keyes, who was my boss then, before my baton succeeded him, he was desperately anxious to mount an operation of any kind against Germany, because he'd got this almost a private army of commandos who'd been kicking their heels doing nothing for about eight months. And if something hadn't happened, there's no question about it, the commando system would have been disbanded altogether. So even a, a relatively unimportant raid was better than no raid at all. Morale wasn't all that high because we had had promises of raids and that none of them had come off. And we had gone on training and with more training. And eventually, here we were, um, ordered to go to some secret place. But we weren't very certain where it was to be. There was a tremendous number of rumors. Remember, at this time, the um, Germans were threatening to attack the south coast of England. And so it was thought that, as we had been trained as guerrillas, we would be used as a guerrilla force behind the Germans, behind the Germans in England. 
But as the 500 troops boarded the ferry steamers, the Queen Emma and the Princess Beatrice, it was revealed that their first taste of action was to be in the remote Lofoten Islands off northern Norway. The Norwegian fishing fleet was of prime importance to the German army, fish and whale oils providing glycerin for explosives. The Lofoten Islands within the Arctic Circle provided 50% of Norway's output. In the event, this first raid was to be one of the strangest the commandos ever mounted. On the move at last, the commandos met their naval escort at Scapa Flow and headed north for the icy Norwegian waters. This was the first joint venture between Navy and Commando, and a proper relationship between the two had yet to be established. There were more chiefs than Indians and divided authorities. There was always a slight reluctance for the Navy to cooperate with the Army at that stage. The um, thing I remember particularly was the nonsense talked about going on deck and how soon that should be done and how long one should wait about before landing, what time one should go ashore. All those things were hotly contested and disagreement between the Army and the Navy. The um, captain of the ship, Kershaw, wanted to have everybody awake all night. Morning officer, I think quite rightly, said, why should they not at least lie fully dressed in their hammocks if necessary rather than freeze to death with cold. So there's a compromise, stupid compromise. No breakfast was given and one went on deck far too soon. Wearing tin hats, which is also a great mistake, the people with uh, common sense wore a sort of cap comforter over their heads and the tin hat resting on the top, which is a pretty silly combination. We never wore, we never wore helmets again in number four commander for the rest of the war, reading. It paralyzes your brain, a tin hat, especially in cold weather. As the ship steamed into the Lofoten Fjord, the men, aided by 50 Norwegian volunteers, prepared for Operation Claymore. A German garrison was thought to guard the key installations, and fierce fighting was anticipated. We set off line ahead with the destroyers uh, escorting us in like uh, a hen with her chicks. Went in, we passed numerous um, fishing smacks going out to do their day's uh, um, fishing. So we had to get down below the gunnels so that they couldn't look into the craft. And we got into the harbour shore there. There was no beach, there was just a, this pier and we had to clamber up it. Now this wasn't easy because the, the spray as it came in froze and of course the gunnels too were, were iced over so to put a, a bamboo uh, ladder on a gunnel and then try and clamber up it was quite an, a performance and also if you fell in that was the end of you because the temperature of the water was uh, minus a few degrees. I remember the first men up the ladders from the harbour skinned their hands. It was so cold on the rungs of the iron ladders up from the boat below that all the skin was torn off the boys' hands the first went up. Some people had to capture certain objectives like the post office was one and the police station was another and obviously the harbour and its installations were the third and then they were given tasks to destroy not only the shipping but factories and all the suspected objects that could be considered useful of the Germans. The demolition parties set about their duties, releasing 800,000 gallons of fish oil into the freezing Arctic waters. Eighteen factories were blown sky high and 11 ships scuttled. I awoke from the cannonade thinking the Germans were bombing. I jumped up, put my skiing trousers over my pyjamas and went outside. I heard it was British and Norwegian troops. I live very close to the post office. When I looked out of my window to the street below, 
I saw a soldier walking there, but he was not a German soldier. The mood among the soldiers was beginning to change, for it was becoming apparent that the expected German opposition was not going to happen. The troops began to mingle with the local inhabitants, and the post office became a popular center from which to send insulting telegrams to Herr Hitler. The uh, commanding officer started to deal with Quislings and reports of people who were Quislings. Other people were blowing up installations, but order totally collapsed. The troops by this time had realized that there was no battle as such. There was no uh, angry Germans, there were no machine guns firing at them. And they began to treat it in quite a different way, but nevertheless uh, felt as if they were doing something. Jed Price, a private with number four commando, left his post on the pier and went in search of some real action. I disappeared and went walk about to see what was going on. I hadn't seen any Germans up to that time, so I thought I'd go and look for some. And uh, I wandered up along the street and there were some shops there, and I saw one shop with some postcards in, and I thought it looked quite good. So I was in the shop and got a couple of postcards, which I offered. You know, I said I couldn't pay for them, but it was sign language. They said, oh, you're very welcome to have taken this, that, and the other. So I came out of there, and I still had a bayonet stuck on the end of my rifle. And I always remember coming out of that shop, someone saying, Jed, you want to get that thing off your rifle, you're going to hurt somebody if you're not careful. So it was that sort of atmosphere, and away we went. We walked all around the place and sort of saying hello to various people. They must have given up food that they'd hoarded them for themselves just to give to us and the coffee. I mean, 20-year-old boys, guardsmen, coffee was the upper crust drink. It was tea for us. You know? So coffee was really something strange. But nevertheless, we uh, did think after, well, they must have deprived themselves of an awful lot to have even given that to us. However, there was serious work to be done. Enemy shipping had to be destroyed. Bill Boucher Myers escorted explosives experts to the Lofoten Fjord. I went with the naval people to lay the explosives in the engine room, set the fuse, came back down, and the man in charge of the engine room in our little ALC had switched the engines off, and then, of course, he couldn't get them started. So here we were with boat hooks and whatever we could get hold of, trying to push ourselves away from this boat, Eventually, the engine spurted into life and away we shot. With a great sigh of relief, I can assure you. We must have destroyed in all maybe six of these, the size of them, probably from a hundred ton to about a thousand ton, nothing bigger than that. While standing on deck, wondering what was going on, there was a direct hit amidships. Fire and smoke belched out. At that instant, we understood something serious was happening. At that point, everyone had to abandon ship. Only two volunteers remained. They said, we'll scuttle her, and then we'll join you. We moored alongside the pontoon, and at the top of the stairway, I saw people with strange, completely flat helmets. At first I thought they were Norwegian soldiers, but I soon learned that they were Englishmen, toting submachine guns and shouting, hands up, hands up. They were in a jolly good mood. I think they had taken a swig of rum beforehand. In any case, the mood amongst the English was friendly. 
und von unserer Seite aus äh, We were perhaps more shocked than unhappy. I suppose we hadn't quite grasped the seriousness of the situation. Patrols were sent on forays to seek and capture Germans who had either fled their post or were, as yet, unaware of the raid. Shimmy Lovett's men attacked an enemy signal station, destroying an important communication center and capturing the hapless radio technicians. We captured some very valuable equipment, which was considered quite important at the time, and all the logs, all the signal apparatus one can carry away. A certain amount of looting was done, which was highly irregular, but I'm afraid at that stage in the war, commanders weren't trained on the rules of the Geneva Convention. The Nazis surrendered without a fight, and 225 prisoners of war including a dozen local Quislings accused of liaising with the enemy, were marched blindfolded to the waiting troop ships. Liaisons of a different nature were taking place on the quayside. And uh, a lot of civvies there, and we had quite a little party on the quay with the civvies. There was a chap there, I think it was Paddy Wall, he had his mouth organs. We had a wee dance on the quay with one or two of the local lasses. And... Uh, there were some volunteers, lots of Norwegians wanted to come back with us, and amongst them were these lasses, and uh, remember the, the signals going out asking permission to bring these girls aboard, and I think, if my memory serves me right, the first answer was no, but the second answer, can we bring volunteers for the services back, was yes, so that was the lasses volunteering for the ATS or something, and that was them on their way. There was a fantastic atmosphere in the town square. Shops and offices were closed. Nobody went to work. There were lots of fishermen at the square and about town. We'd heard that the English had come to liberate northern Norway. Then we heard it was only a raid, that they were going back. We asked an officer if we could return with them. He said he would telegraph on board as they needed nurses. I said I couldn't stand the sight of blood. Do you know typing and stenography? Yes, we answered. Then you must come with us. I think there's always a sort of brave young girl who's quite ready to take a chance. They only, they only sailed with their knapsacks on their backs. No, no, no suitcases or handbags or anything else. Accompanied by over 300 volunteers, the commandos departed Lofoten in triumphant mood. Objectives successfully completed, they had spent less than six hours on Norwegian soil. We then started down the, the fjord, uh, and a German spotter plane came and circled and circled, and eventually, obviously, was reporting our position, and it went. And then came the first air assault on us by German aircraft. But uh, thanks to the Navy, who seemed to keep them away from us, uh, there were no casualties from this. We then went into Scarpa, and then aboard came the people from, I suppose, MI5 or MI6, I don't know, to interview the Squizzlings, the raw military police to take over the POWs, and uh, Norwegian forces to continue the safe travel of their nurses. That all done, we, we were left aboard the Emma, and she brought us round the, the same route round the, the Western Isles back into Gurak, and then back to our home base, which was true. The 225 prisoners of war were sent to camps, including Glen Branta in Argyle. There, they were put to work in forestry and in agriculture. The BBC had given the raid a lot of publicity. Public morale was very low at that time, uh, expecting the German invasions and what have you. And this, of course, was a great opportunity for propaganda, and everybody gave it front-page news, and we were top of the pops wherever we went with commandos, and well, life was great for quite a wee while after that. People coming up in the street, and trying to ask you what you did, and what was it like, and pleased to see you back, and 
How many Germans did you kill? That was one of the questions that was invariably, how many Germans did you kill? But as the people of Britain, hungry for any good news, celebrated the success of the raid, the people of the Lofoten Islands were left to face the wrath of the Germans. As the afternoon wore on, we noticed the presence of reconnaissance aircraft. Then some fast German motor torpedo boats turned up. They were carrying the vanguard of the German reinforcements. As far as I remember, they were SS troops. The cinema was surrounded by these soldiers. That's where the first arrests were made. The Germans must have been keenly aided in picking out the wanted. The Germans had been humiliated. They had lost 14 men in the raid and had been shown to be unprepared for attack. A second successful raid on the Lofotans plus assaults on Spitzbergen and Vagso rubbed salt into the wound. Hitler instructed German high command to deploy 300,000 troops to the Norwegian garrison, a strategic move that many consider the turning point in the war, for these troops could have been deployed on the beaches of Normandy. In fact, the Allies never returned to Scandinavia, but the success of the Lofoten raid secured the commando's future. Uh, we became very professional later and became shock troops eventually. And having been considered a private army and a damn nuisance to regular soldiers, we, we accepted finally by the time of saint Nazaire and Dieppe and one or two of the bigger raids that we, we, we could do a job. I can't speak too highly of the commanders as they ended up. They had a complete confidence in themselves and a, and a remarkable degree of contempt for the opposition, which is, always helps when you're raiding. They thought it was out of the question they could go wrong. The volunteers who survived the rigors of the Achnacari training knew they had a tough job ahead of them. Nothing again would ever be as easy as the first Lofoten raid. Indeed, all the Scandinavian raids were 100% successful, both economically and militarily. They went on to prove their valor in much bloodier battles, gaining 38 battle honors in their five years of active service. One in three commandos were killed or wounded in the Normandy landings, and over 1,700 commandos lost their lives during the course of the war. We may feel sure that nothing of which we have any knowledge or record had ever been done by mortal men which surpasses the splendor and daring of their feats of arms. Or we may say of them, when shall their glory fade? 